what lessons does the 75 year old film have for for us today uh, the lessons from it's a wonderful life have grown on me uh, in the in the course of my life watching this film um, you know very regularly at Christmas and today I mean I think what what is you know the major cloud over our lives today is the pandemic and it's a wonderful life is about um, how the, your circle of friends and the people you have in your community and just pulling in your borders and being there is really what gives you meaning and quality in life. And poor George Bailey wanted to go see the world and he wanted to travel. And when I was younger, I saw the film. I was kind of mad at the town for putting all this pressure on him to stay and everything. But he did. And, it, it, you know, it's a film about sacrifice and pulling in your borders and making the life that you have with the uh, people you have around you mean something. And that's what people have had to do during the pandemic. And so it's, you realize the richest, richness you have just here at home, as, as they say at the end of the movies, is, as long as you have friends, as long as you have people, and as long as you reach out to people. And that's a big, important lesson in this, you know, these past two years. Do you worry that too, we're too self-absorbed to take in the lessons of this great movie? We have become self-absorbed because it's, we've become focused on attention to ourselves. You know, and social media has, has made that work. You know, it's, it's, it's helped that trend. But the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is about, it's the opposite of selfish, selfishness. You know, it's about, it is about decency and honesty, but it's also about sacrifice. And what I love about the movie, being an anthropologist, is that it, it's all about the essence of our humanity, which is sociality. We are a social animal, and nobody succeeds as an island. No man is an island. Nobody succeeds alone. And having been, um, you know, living that humanity means sometimes sacrifice or taking from others. It means both things. Mm -hmm. You know, and George Bailey in the end is bailed out by the town, by all the people he helped. You know, I think he, he made that not long after the war. And I think the country really needed a movie like that. So this was his first movie after, after the war. Dad's military service and his time in the military is the thing he's most proud of in his life. And I think it is, it is when he felt he really gave back what he, what he should. And he, he's very proud of that. But it was hard, you know, and there have been books written that talked about, they didn't call it PTSD then, but you know, he was, I didn't really, Dad never talked about the war to us. I would ask him and, you know, he would sometimes have nightmares in the middle of the night where he'd wake up and, you know, there were bombers coming at him, Mom said. Um, but I think when he came back from the war, first of all, he didn't know if he could pick up his career again because it had been so long. And did he want to? Did, was it trivial? You know, after what he'd been through is, is just making movies and trivial. And then I think, you know, Capra came to him with this film and it was the vehicle for him to get back into filmmaking. You know, I, I, he, he couldn't have made just a straightforward, fun comedy, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I guess perhaps ironically, uh, it didn't take off right away. Uh, it it no. took a while. And oh, I don't. What was his experience like saying, I made this film that I really care about, I guess people don't like it, all right, on to the next one, but then later, to have it become the movie it is, while he was alive, I mean, very much changed. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes the, the trajectory of the film's popularity kind of follows my own reaction to the film as I watched it growing up. So, you know, it was an okay film. I liked it and it was dead and it was, you know, you cried at the end, kind of happy tears. And then as I grew older and the more I watched it, the more I realized what an unbelievable film it is. And that's kind of what the public did yeah. with the film. 
Yeah. But I'm, I, I think Dad was really uh, proud of that film and his performance in it. And I think he's, he was really happy that finally it got the attention. I don't think he expected the attention that it did get, but that it was appreciated finally. Mm. Yeah, and, and you said off camera, but th this ranked pretty high on his list of movies that he'd made? Yeah, I think I mean, when I would ask Dad what's your favorite film, I think he'd say, he, he would say it, it, it would have to be It's a Wonderful Life, and I think he was um, proud of his performance, mm -hmm. and he loved working with Capra. What's your favorite scene? Oh, God. Uh, you know, I have to say the scene in the bar where he is absolutely, as he says, at the end of his rope, but it's, it's a really great scene of despair. I think, but oh man, the scene of him and Donna Reed doing the Charleston is, you know, they're just these wonderful, comic, just perfect scenes, perfect movie scenes in that movie, and then they fall into the water, everybody jumps into the water, you know. I love that scene. And then there are a few scenes with Clarence that, but you know, the bar scene I would have to pick, and, and, and the Charleston scene. It really is phenomenal acting as he, I mean, culminating kind of in the, in the bar scene, but even leading up to that, just the, the unraveling, you know, uh -huh. the man coming undone. Uh-huh, and he's, everything is so wonderful, and he's, you know, the world is his oyster at the beginning of the film, and he's, he's all legs and arms, you know, in that dancing scene, and then he just becomes a desperate man trying to carry this load that he's doing for other people. And, you know, the other scene, you know, so when I'm asked what's, what's my favorite scene, then they keep, but man, when he tells Potter what's what, that is a great scene. Beyond this movie, I mean, what, what's one of your favorite things about your dad as you look back on your time with him? Dad as a father was great because he never lectured us on how to be good. He didn't lecture us on believing in God. I mean, he didn't, direct us. He just, he taught us by the way he lived. And I think that was, um, that was a really great thing about him as a father. He was just an example, you know. And he never brought his work home. He came through the door and so Hollywood stayed out. And that's, you know, you think now, uh, I mean, everything has changed, but I can't imagine growing up the way I did now with a father who was as famous as he was when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. This wouldn't happen, mm -hmm. which is too bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe, you know, there, there are people who can pull it off. There are people, but they gotta try. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have fences around the house. There was no security. You know, fans would come to the door all the time. <laughs> yeah. Your, uh, your father was a Hollywood movie star and you took a decidedly different path, you know, uh, pursuing you know, a life in academia and research and, and your work with gorillas. And um, was that a conscious departure or did you just find yourself drawn to that? I was first taken to Africa on a safari with my parents when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And after that, I said, I want to do something with wild animals in Africa. And my parents got into conservation and my mom started reading books about anthropology and she gave me them when I was in high school and that was it. And my parents were all for it. You know, I remember saying to dad when I went off to, when I first went to Rwanda to Diane Fossey's camp, I said, I have no idea what's gonna happen. I've never been to Diane Fossey's camp. It's, it's you know, 10,000 feet up in the mountains and. I said, I had no idea what's going to happen. And Dad said, well, I think that's wonderful. I think Dad breathed a sigh of relief that we did not want to get into the film industry. I imagine so. He probably saw some things that he didn't share with, he didn't bring home. Well, of course not. And, yeah. you know, he, he did say to me once, it's hard for a woman. Mm. You know, was, he said, I'm not sure you want to do, you know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was little, there was one period, you know, a few months where I thought, well, that would be fun you know, to do this. Yeah, and it hard, hard for a woman now, but how much more so back then when the beauty standards were even more narrow. I know, and, you know I you, know. You hit a certain age and... And the, you, you know, and you were, the, the women, everything of their lives was controlled by the studios. And, mm -hmm. But then we, I, I went and saw Dad on the set, I think twice. 
I remember we were on the set of, um, uh, Hallow West was one, and it looked so boring to do this because you do something for like three minutes and they'd stop and everybody would come running around and do your face and do the camera and everything and then they say, okay, roll them and it just was like that all day. And it just, and I went to the, I think dad invited us in the sets so we would say, God, we don't want to do this. This doesn't look fun at all. I mean, the stage looked much more fun to me than doing the movies. Dad evolved with the film industry and I think after the war, films became different. And, you know, life was darker and more layered after the war. I really think f films, I mean, D Dad still made comedies and fun films after the war, but it was more and more, um, I think he was more drawn to more layered characters. Yeah, that, that more, more multi-dimensional, and I, you know, I just, I think the war had a big impact. Did he stay in touch with his Wonderful Life castmates at all? I think he stayed in touch with Donna Reed. I think I might have met Donna Reed, but he, I don't think any of them were friends that came over to the house, for instance. Okay, I told him I would ask, but I have a friend who said, ask her for her best impression of her father. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I will let him know. <laughs> My um, sister is the one that does a good Jimmy Stewart impression. Your twin sister, right? My twin sister, and we're, we're, we're not identical. She looks really a lot like Dad. Do you know what was the deal with the squirrel and the raven? Uh, the you know, <laughs> I don't know. That, I mean, that is extremely quirky because it wasn't important for this man to have the raven, but I think it indicated he was a very, very eccentric character. And, um, you know, he had these animals as friends, so, you know, maybe kind of had a hard time with solid, solid friendships or something. But that's why, you know, he's, you can imagine somebody like him losing $8,000. Yeah. You know, scatterbrain, scatterbrain, but his friends were the squirrel and the raven. So I think it was this, brilliant, funny little way to say, this is what this man's like. And I, you know, I love the character of Clarence because Clarence never lies to dad. I mean, George Bailey says, who are you? And he just very straightforward, I'm here to save you. I'm, and he always just answered very, why'd you jump? I jumped in so you would jump in and save me. And you know, he was always just totally straightforward which, you know, I really got that last night when I watched it. My mom, my, her final question was, did you grow up singing Buffalo Gals? But then I also wonder, was there anything from the film that, you know, your dad brought into your childhood or anything like well, that? Well, when I started um, singing Buffalo Gals was when I really reconnected with my cousins who were dad's nephews and a niece back east. And I didn't see them a lot when I was, a kid, but I reconnected them, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, reconnected with them, and they are all, they're the, uh, the sons are very artistic, my, my nephews are very artistic, and ma, uh, dad's mother was very artistic, and um, they play old time music, and they sang, they got together and sang Buffalo Gals, why don't you go out tonight, and um, we, we met once at at an event at Dad's hometown in Indiana, Pennsylvania. I remember we were all in hotel room together, and they were and they were singing that, and they're they're with their instruments. They brought their instruments, and they're very good musicians, and they all sang, and it was really terrific. Is there anything else that you want folks to know about this movie and what what the movie means to you? What your what your father means to you? Dad means to me the same as a, a great father means to. To anybody but the fact that he is still being embraced by people that his legacy lives on is uh, see this is when I get teary-eyed <laughs> the gift to a family <laughs> that he lives I'm so proud that you know this is he lives on and he means something to different generations and 
you know, I really do think in our divided country, the message of It's a Wonderful Life and the way George Bailey does cross the aisle is important.